Tom, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and congratulations on the important work that you have not only done to promote uh, educational opportunity for immigrants, for people of color, and for low-income students, but the work that you will continue to do uh, in your new role here at Teachers College. Uh, you are the perfect choice for the 11th president of Teachers College, and I know you will build on the great work of this esteemed institution. Uh, I also want to take a minute to thank Phyllis Kossoff, Thank you so much for your lifelong commitment to education, your philanthropy, uh, and especially your work around cystic fibrosis research and awareness. Uh, uh, all of this are the things which legends are made of, uh, and it's an honor to be in your presence. So thank you very much uh, for that as well. And for everyone here today, I want to thank you because I know that you share my fierce urgency to provide every New York City student uh, with an education that will prepare them to be citizens of tomorrow. Uh, so I want to thank you for being here. And uh, before I go too much further, you know, we don't do this work alone. Uh, and I am just very, very happy and excited that uh, she agreed to be with me here today, but my wife is here with me, so I want to thank Monique for being here with me as well. We don't often have an opportunity to take your wife to work day, and today is that day. So I want to thank you. Quisiera decir unas cuantas palabras en español, no es porque yo creo que no hay personas que hablan español, sino que fue mi primer lenguaje. Y yo creo que es importante tener esa oportunidad de decir unas cuantas palabras en la primer idioma que yo tuve cuando vi entre las escuelas públicas. Y darle las gracias por la oportunidad de estar aquí. Now, for some of you that uh, may speak Spanish, you understood what I just said. And for some of you that don't speak Spanish, I wasn't trying to be rude, but I want to ground us uh, in the conversation that we're going to have today. And I want to... If you do not speak Spanish, you are going to be officially categorized as Spanish language learners. Uh, but I want you to have the sense that as we speak, thousands of students in New York City are having that experience today in the public schools of New York City who happen to be English language learners. Uh, and while we have many, many attributes that we can point to. We have degrees, we have experiences, we are very, very knowledgeable in those things that we hold dear. The only thing that kept you from understanding what I just said was the language. That's the incredible gifts that our students bring to us uh, in New York City. So I wanna thank you for allowing me to ground us in the conversation we're gonna have. I also have to say I'm, I'm more than excited to be here because over my almost 30 years in education, I can't even keep track of the number of teacher teams when I was a principal or as a superintendent that we paid and sent to Teachers College to be trained um, and helped us move student achievement in a very measurable way. So for me, it's a real honor to be here at Teachers College. So I'd like to talk about our shared mission to advance equity. And one of the things that I've talked about this year is that we, undergirding all of our priority work, is the notion that we are going to advance equity, not in sometime in the future, not perhaps when things are aligned, not perhaps when uh, the funding mechanisms are actually aligned, although we know we're working hard on that. We're going to advance equity now. And the reason for the urgency of now is because students are in our classrooms right now. We know that Teachers College is a beacon for the nation in so, so many ways, uh, but from your training approach, which connects theory with practice to the mission to advance educational equity, we are natural partners with the Department of Education and Teachers College. We in the Department of Education are also clear about what we want to achieve. Uh, New York City's Equity and Excellence Agenda for All, which I will spell out for you in some detail in just a moment, is our guide. It is not the only guide, but it is our guide. It has already put us on the path to reach or surpass our goals of 80% graduation rate and two-thirds college readiness by 2026. Now, just last week, we were proud to announce a record number of students enrolling in college. 1,600 more students compared to last year. So as we track our progress, we want to be sure that we're continuing to uh, build upon the good work that's been done. 
We also have a goal that 5,000 more students are going to be college ready every year compared to when Mayor Bill de Blasio first took office in 2014. We are well on our way, but I have, and I know you have a sense of urgency to be even better and to do this even faster. Now, I talk about equity a lot, and folks across the city have heard me in a very impassioned way. Uh, I appreciate what the, parent, the president said in sometimes a very unvarnished, very clear way about some of the challenges around equity that we have in our city. Um, uh, but I want to be clear that every moment that I'm New York City School Chancellor is an opportunity to advance equity now. And I want to be clear that I was not born a chancellor. Uh, I will not die a chancellor. So there is an opportunity right now to do the work of empowering our students and empowering our community around equity. So let's define the term very clearly. You've probably heard some people describe equity, uh, and what they're really describing is equality, treating every student the same. Let's make no mistake, equality is terribly important, but you see it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't disrupt, disrupt the entrenched systems that throughout our history have kept underserved students from achieving their greatest potential. It doesn't address the opportunity gaps that face black and Latino students. By the way, of the 1.1 million students in the New York City Department of Education in our traditional public schools, 70% of whom are black and Latino. So when I'm asked the question, why do you talk so much about black and Latino students? My question is, how can we afford not to talk about black and Latino students? <laughs> Equality won't change the fact that our black and Latino students' graduation rates lag behind their peers by more than 10 percentage points. And it won't change the fact that while 26% of our students are black and 46% of our suspensions are of black students. Think of that for one minute, the disproportionality that exists in just one but many indicators called suspensions. Only an equity approach and an eye towards equity and ensuring equity can right these wrongs in our system. In New York City, equity means that we have the same high expectations for all of our students. We're not lowering the bar, whatever their race, whatever their ethnicity, whatever their zip code. Equity means that we acknowledge that some of our students need more support than others, and we give them the resources that they need to succeed. And while in my almost 30 years as an educator, folks have always said to me, you know, money isn't the issue. We just can't throw money at the issue. Just one of those almost 30 years, I wish somebody would have thrown money at the issue. <laughs> give us a chance to prove that wrong. Equity means that we can accelerate our work and reverse historic injustices and empower communities and intervene throughout a child's journey throughout our system. Equity also means that all of our students are on a path to high school graduation, on a path to post-secondary success, whatever that looks like. It could be college. It could be meaningful employee, employment. It could be other types of career opportunities. But if we're going to get there, we have to keep it real. I was in high school this morning and the students helped me keep it real, so I'm going to use the vernacular. We have to keep it real. And yes, we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is segregation. Now, I've lived and worked in communities throughout this country. In fact, I've lived and worked now in five states in five different school systems, all, all of them large urban school systems. And I can tell you firsthand that all of these places and in all of these places, there is housing and school segregation. It comes with living in large areas and urban areas and forces that forces and forces that go back many, many decades. And I'm not discounting that. It includes housing policies that perpetuated isolation by race and income and red line. But a public and I underline the word public school system should represent the entire city it serves. In New York City, just as in other cities that I've worked in, that's often not the case. Long established school admissions policies that reinforce segregation, including when we quote unquote screen students through selective admission processes. Why does that matter to us? 
We are about expanding opportunity and not shrinking it. Integration advances equity, especially in a community in a city like New York City, one of the most diverse communities, not in the nation, but one of the most diverse communities in the world. It's a common sense. Our students learn from one another's diverse backgrounds and experiences. Separate is inherently not equal. And you see, that question was definitively settled 64 years ago in Brown versus Board of Education when the highest court of the land definitively settled that question and said separate is never equal, especially as it pertains to the education of children. Yet 64 years later, I asked the question, not rhetorically, but in a sincere way of asking for an answer. What do we have to show for? integration 64 years post Brown versus Board of Education. There's research behind integration in that education in an integrated way is good for every single child. It doesn't lower academic achievement for anybody. In fact, it improves academic achievement for all. Truly all boats are lifted with an integrated approach. Segregation on the other hand does shrink opportunity. If you're a black or Latino student and you're st you are statistically less likely to be in an accelerated program and you are systematically shut out of specialized schools in our city compared to your peers. That's not my opinion, that's the fact. This year's incoming class at Stuyvesant High School, a phenomenal school with an incredible principal. This year's incoming class has three. Three percent of the incoming class are black students. In a city like New York City with a public school system like New York City, how can that be okay? Because either it's the students who are biologically, genealogically, psychologically incapable of being admitted to a school like Stuyvesant, or perhaps there are systems and structures to identify students for that opportunity that are not calibrated to who our students are. Perhaps there's an enlightened way forward. If you're a black or Latino student currently in New York City, you have less access to advanced placement courses and a lower likelihood of graduating and of graduating college ready. The inequities that are born of segregation follow students throughout their lives, disadvantaging them both socially and economically. I would say to you the 1.1 million students currently sitting in classrooms right now in New York City are the very future economic drivers of New York City's vitality in the future. We are calling this problem what it is and confronting it head on. It is segregation and it is systemic. And our work around advancing equity now is to disrupt, dismantle, and change a system that advantages some but does not serve all. We are taking a hard look at some of our enrollment practices from 3K to 12th grade. Why do we have a system that we do and are they the best interests of the children that we serve? Are they in the best interest of our city, of its future economic viability, which rests in our public schools? We have started to integrate schools in some of our most segregated school districts. Let me talk a little bit about some of those examples. District 15 and their diversity plan. You may have read about this. You may have heard about the work that our citizens in New York City did. I'm extremely proud of them. In August of 2017, the Department of Education began a community-driven process to integrate middle schools in Brooklyn's District 15. Now, many of you know this as a beautifully diverse district that represents New York City in many, many ways. Unfortunately, many District 15 middle schools have long excluded low-income black and Latino students. Others basically served only low-income black and Latino students. So the notion that if you're matriculating into middle school, you have to apply, you have to interview, you have to submit materials. At times your parents had to come in for an interview and then through a process, which I will call through magical realism, a magical process, certain students are admitted and other students are not. The District 15 diversity planning process brought everyone to the table. Community members across the district had a tough but necessary conversation and they had many conversations, conversations that were grounded in the data 
and occurring in different languages. I had an opportunity to sit in on a couple. And after all, our public schools belong to everyone. And the District 15 Committee looked at the data. They looked at potential solutions. They put forward a plan that I was proud to approve. Now the academic screens are gone, replaced by a lottery where students will be matched to the schools they want to attend. District 15 middle schools will also prioritize about half of their seats for students from low-income families, English language learners, and students in temporary housing. And in case you hadn't heard, we have the greatest number of our students in this city that are in temporary housing this year, and the number is only growing. This is real action, my friends, with real buy-in, with real ownership of this plan and the success of the implementation of the plan. And it's not just District 15. There are 90 schools across the city that now have a diversity in admissions plan in place. We are continuing to support other schools to develop their diversity in admissions. And that's up ju from just seven schools when the diversity in admissions program started only three years ago. So we're moving that needle. Slowly but surely, we're disrupting the status quo. We are advancing equity now, not sometime in the future. And most of this work has come from the grassroots bottom up, so to speak. These are plans owned by our principals and superintendents at the local level, by PTAs and parent-led community education councils who are ready to put the elbow grease in to make them successful. At the same time, we just can't punt integration of individual schools and communities. We have to put grassroots bottom-up approaches in play with top-down vision, resources, and action. And this administration is supporting school deseg desegregation like never before. We've signaled it in the way that we call it what it is. We've signaled it in the way that we invest in our students in our schools. And we've signaled it in the way that we tackle historic inequities and expand opportunities for all. Now, one late breaking development in this equity for all is we just, on my way here, announced that for the first time in this enrollment cycle, students with disabilities who are applying to schools that have partial or full access will receive admissions priority over other students. Why is that important? Because in a city like New York City that I would just say with 1,800 schools has what I call a historic portfolio of school buildings, which is another way of saying we have a lot of old buildings. Accessibility is not quite a reality in all of our buildings. Yet I'm going to talk in a few minutes about what we're doing to address that in the next year, five-year capital plan. But you see, equity now demands that we can't wait for the five-year capital plan. There are mechanisms that we can use right now to ensure students with disabilities have access to their schools. That is one of the things that we're doing. Now, when we talk about ex equity and excellence for all, what does that mean? Whether our students attend school with mostly white peers or the school is entirely black or brown, they all deserve excellence. It's not about one group over another. Every student needs the opportunity to develop invaluable life skills and the social capital that helps to open doors. It's not enough to solely focus on integration. We must also be laser focused on driving equity and excellence at every school, in every neighborhood, and in every corner of our great city. So let's talk about the specifics of our equity and excellence for all agenda, which begins at the crucial early ages through our pre-K for all initiative, and now our 3K for all initiative. This is universal free, full-day, high-quality early childhood education for our four-year-olds. And it soon will be full-day, universal for our three-year-olds as well. And my friends, we'll take, a, we'll take a, a round of applause for that. My friends, as we think about the significance of this, remember that in New York City, we have added, almost added, with the addition of 3K, two full grade levels for all of our children, which is a game changer. It's, an inc it's incredible how hungry our children are for knowledge. And if you give it to them, they will grow and learn even faster. And if they don't get it, they will not reach their full potential. And we know, in fact, some of the research that emanates right here from Teachers College has shown us 
that students that have an opportunity gap and an achievement gap when they enter kindergarten is ameliorated by early education, high quality early education. This is an equity initiative in action. 3K and pre-K are the linchpin of fairness in our city, of giving every child an equal shot at reaching their potential. It doesn't matter how much their parents make. All that matters is that they have a child and they're going to have them in an early universal pre-K or 3K program. And this is a result of the visionary leadership, and I have to say this and I can't say it enough, the visionary leadership of our New York City Mayor, Ms. Bill de Blasio. This is the only universal pre-K program, and I've lived all over the country, where it is you truly universal for all of our pre-K students. But by the same token, the research tells us that children who are not reading on grade level by the beginning of third grade are less likely to obtain a high school diploma. When I lived and worked in California, the Department of Corrections used the number of students that were not literate at third grade to project the number of jail cells that they would need in the future. So we know that there is a link between the inability to read at early levels and the eventual life outcomes of many of our children. Literacy truly is a building block for future success, not only in career, but in life. So through our universal literacy, we aim to have 100% of our second graders reading at grade level by 2026. Think about that, the largest city in America having 100% of its children reading at grade level by 2026, an audacious goal. The psychometricians may say, don't say that because no one ever gets 100%. If we don't have 100%, if our goal is not 100% and we don't do everything we can to reach that 100%, we just may get to 96, 97, 98%. And that would be great for our community. Being proficient in algebra is another important predictor of a student's future success. Through our Algebra for All initiative, we aim to improve elementary and middle school math instruction and ensure that all eighth graders have access to algebra. These initiatives I've mentioned, plus the Computer Science for All, AP for All, and College Access for All are, beating, are the beating heart of our mission to advance equity now. Let me give you another example of what this looks like. On the first day of school this year, I had the pleasure of visiting two advanced placement classes uh, at a high school in uh, Soundview in the Bronx. The students were fantastic. They were tackling the challenging topic of gun violence in our communities and schools, a very relevant topic, if you remember. In the AP US history, class students were using a discussion protocol to talk about the Second Amendment, tying that into a much larger conversation about whether or not America has lived up to its ideals as a nation. In the AP Psychology classroom, students were actively citing evidence from their summer reading to connect po policing in their communities to questions of bias, perception, and how our brains think and react to those particular issues. You see, our students aren't just sitting in a row being lectured to. They're active participants. They're using primary source material along with their lived experiences to bring meaning to the topics that we are discussing. So as part of our Equity and Excellence for All agenda, we are investing in AP courses like those and these at 250 schools, and about 80 of which have had none before. Now, this is something that I spoke about earlier, disparities in access to advanced placement classes. Really, disparities in what we're telling our young adults. Imagine that. Students at 80 schools across the city who were getting the message that they weren't ready for rigorous college prep work. The message that we were sending them that we don't really think you can cut it in these kinds of courses and that you might not get the college credit that you should be able to get. We've changed that. 80 schools that are now, that were, and that are overwhelmingly in low income neighborhoods like Soundview, South Bronx, Central Brooklyn. My friends, that's not an accident. Just like it's not an accident where more middle school students are taking algebra, where students are more likely to have attended preschool. We're not fixing it by accident either. We're being deliberate, and we're being strategic, and we're being intentional. And I will also say to you, because I'm in a room full of teachers, college lovers, we're going to be unapologetic about it as well. Now, 
As we expand our equity and excellence for all initiatives, I'm also proud of the historic investment that we've made in anti-bias and culturally relevant education training. Now these terms may seem abstract, but they're really not. They're central to advancing equity now. Our own biases affect which children are in those AP classes. I discussed that. And which schools get those AP classes in the first place. They affect which children are even in the classroom and which are suspended and unable to learn in a classroom setting. You see, there's real aid urgency in this work and the positive message that it sends when it's done right and the negative messages that it sends to many of our children if it's not done right is that there isn't an opportunity for all. So earlier this year, my team came to me with an amazing plan and said, Chancellor, here's our plan to bring anti-bias training to all 150,000 of our school and instructional staff over four years. And as I listen to the plan, and when you think about bringing that kind of embedded professional development, that's not just drive-by professional development, it's regular professional development. I said, that is a great plan, but we're not gonna do it in four years. We're gonna do it in two years. And thanks to that fantastic team, that's exactly what we're doing right now. I've attended several of the trainings and I can tell you that they are intense. More than a couple of tears have been shed. More than a few red faces have been had. But we've introduced educators to the practice of individualization where they learn how to focus on the things that make people individuals. We practice seeing each other as people, not as demographics. This is a powerful way to break down stereotypes. And we discuss, discuss the implicit bias through the lens of paradoxes. How our unconscious brains can stop us from living out our values of equity and fairness and in the context of education, how they work. These are tough conversations and are a key step towards dismantling inequity. Because my friends, if we don't name it and understand it, we cannot fix it. And probably the most powerful message, and I don't know if anyone follows me on Twitter, uh, but one of the powerful messages that I send every year, and I've been accused of, uh, of being a serial retweeter, and I'm guilty as charged. But at the start of the year, every year, and probably at the start of this calendar year, I'm going to retweet it again, is a picture of an eight-year-old girl and her quote. And the quote is very simply this. My teacher thought I was smarter than I was, so I was. That is the power of implicit bias training. So my friends, we are naming it and we're going further. We believe that the diversity in New York City student body is what makes our schools unique. It's what makes them special. And we are pr pr proving our commitment to diversifying by investing in curricula, which all students can see for themselves. Culturally relevant education brings learning to life for students. Learning about authors, about leaders, about great people who look like they do, who grew up like they did. And we know that they can propel children to success by seeing themselves in the curriculum and seeing themselves in the school. When I was a teacher, I spent almost a decade in the classroom and my introduction said that I was a bilingual social studies slash music teacher. Yes, I was a mariachi teacher. And let me tell you a little bit about why that was important because in Tucson, Arizona, where I grew up, only 52 miles from the Mexican border, there was no border. Because if you look at the history of the Southwest, the border crossed the people, the people never crossed the border. So in that community with deep ties to their cultural past and having graduated from the same school that I had the honor to come back and teach in, I found that when I came back as a teacher that the band programs in the orchestra programs and the choir programs were decimated. Kids wanted nothing to do with it. They didn't participate. The Marching 100, which was the band when I was in high school, was the Marching One Dozen. And as I met with students, and I, you see I worked my way through college gigging as a mariachi, weddings, parties, you know, anniversaries, divorce parties, those were always the most fun. And students would see their history teacher on the weekend performing in his mariachi uniform. Very soon students came to me and said, Mr. Carranza, how do we do this? And we started a little guitar club after school in my social studies class. 
And what I found was that the students that had incredible talent were not participating in the institutional representations of their musical talent. They weren't in the band. They weren't in the choir. And in the Mexican culture, Vicente Fernandez, who is a very well-known singer, kids wanted to be Vicente Fernandez, yet they would not be part of the choir. So my colleague in the choir had a hard time having boys in the choir. So as we started to capture what their desires were, when we captured who they were, we started a mariachi program. And in that mariachi program, the erstwhile Vicente Fernandez that wanted to sing like Vicente Fernandez, absolutely, my friend, but you have to be in the choir because you have to learn how to sing, you have to learn how to vocalize, and I want you to be able to have different kinds of genres under your belt. The students that wanted to play violin in my mariachi, absolutely, come on down, but you have to also be in the, in the orchestra because think about how much fun it would be to be able to play your violin twice a day rather than just once with me. And the trumpet players in the band, I can tell you that when I left the classroom almost 10 years later, with that program being established for almost nine years, we went from 11 students that first year to having almost 300 students in the mariachi program alone. And when you looked at the band, the band was bursting at the seams with new sections all throughout the day. The choir was doing incredibly well, winning regional competitions. The orchestra had five different sections of orchestra, including a symphonic section. And these were all populated by students who saw themselves in the curricula. And all of a sudden, they went from wanting to just play mariachi music to also wanting to know about Mozart and about Beethoven, and wanting to study for the regional competitions, and some of them even getting scholarships that were musical scholarships. Now, why do I share this with you? Because in those communities where some people may have said, these are children that are in a barrio, these are children that don't speak English. These are children whose parents are disconnected to their education and don't see the value of their education. There is nothing more powerful than to see a grandparent in the audience when their grandchild, who is a tough guy, sings for them on Mother's Day, Las Mañanitas, which is a traditional song that you sing in all kinds of celebrations. There is nothing more powerful to see that intergenerational connectivity where you have now bridged generations through music, through song, through culture, while that student is not only singing for his grandmother, that student is preparing for their regional competition as a choir baritone. That is the power of culturally relevant education. And that's what it looks like. And on the way, one way to describe it is that through the metaphor of mirrors or windows or sliding doors, a concept, by the way, that was put forth by uh, someone who I appreciate tremendously, Ohio State educator Rudin Sims Bishop, is to talk about what this looks like through the metaphors of mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. You see, our curricula should serve as a window through which students can see other worlds and develop empathy. But our curricula should also serve as a mirror so that our students can see themselves as who they are. In every book, in every classroom, in every school activity, students should see reflections of themselves. But most importantly, our curricula should also serve as a sliding glass door. When students can step into another world where they don't just see themselves, but they can be themselves. We must show our students that through the literature we read, in the language that we use, in the way that we invest in our resources, that we are deeply connected to society and that we make up different voices and perspectives all in one community. And that's what we're doing right now. Our chief academic officer, Dr. Linda Chen, by the way, a graduate of the Teachers College, is making sure that our teaching materials include a diverse range of communities and topics. This includes the Passport to Social Studies curriculum, which has been adopted by about 80% of our K-8 schools in just its third year. The Passport includes lesson plans about African, Latino, Asian, Middle Eastern, Native heritage peoples, as well as about gender, LGBTQ, and religious history and topics. We also have Educating Powerful Writers, and we have the Hidden Voices product, Project. The resource guides on all of these curricula are aligned 
We are developing a civics for all curriculum that will reorganize and purposefully include, include undocumented students. In short, we are ripe with opportunities to make our curricula not only the mirrors and the windows, but the sliding glass doors for our students. And as we talk about equity here today, the, about truly reaching and serving our students, I want to urge you all to keep one other question in mind. How do we truly reach and serve our parents? You see, we talk a lot about engaging our parents, yet I'm not interested in just engaging our parents. That's a very low bar. We must truly empower our parents, not just by paying lip service to our parents about parent engagement, but when we talk about what a child goes to what school, do parents know about the school options that are available to them? You see, knowledge is power. When we talk about children learning in school, do parents know what they should be talking to teachers about at parent-teacher conferences at night? Does a parent know what their child in the second grade curricula that's aligned to the New York State standards, what should that child know by winter break? What should that child know by spring break? At the end of the year, what should that child know in terms of mastering that curriculum? Do, their, do parents know about their children? Uh, do, do parents know that their children should be able to take algebra in the eighth grade or college prep courses in high school? You see, knowledge is power. I recently attended a first ever Spanish language specialized high school information fair in the Bronx. Now, it's no surprise I have a little bit of an issue with how we provide opportunities for students to specialize schools, but the system is a system. And one of the things that was very clear is that we weren't providing information to our parents. So I went to this first ever Spanish language specialized high school information fair in the Bronx. Now, no matter how the system operates, we need to make sure that our families have the, empower, the empowered information to navigate our system. And here's what we did. We identified top performing middle school students whose home language was Spanish. We called their homes. We didn't just send them a letter. We called their homes. We invited them and their parents to an information session in their community. At the information session, we talked to them about what the specialized schools are. We talked about the specialized schools, high school admissions test, how you could get tutoring for free for this test, the timeline for preparing for and taking the test. We partnered with our uh, community partners in the Hispanic Federation, and we had our schools there to talk about what their schools were. The session was conducted completamente en español. And I heard from so many parents of those Spanish-speaking students that said in their native language, I've never had this kind of information. The infrastructure, and this is the infrastructure that we need for our parents to be empowered and be active participants in their children's education. We need more of it in historically underserved communities, and this is what I would call an infrastructure for equity. So for me, my friends, and this is in my closing, for me, this work is extremely personal. Some of you may know that I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, because I just told you. The grandson of Mexican immigrants, and my parents never attended college. I vividly remember, and I I'll tell you why this is so powerful for me. Because my brother, I have a twin brother, by the way. His name is Ruben. Uh, I'm four minutes older than Ruben. Uh, he, he still disputes that, because I don't have any documentary evidence to prove that. Uh, but I said, Mom said so, so it is. But Ruben and I always knew we were going to go to college, not because my parents had been to college, not because they knew what it was like to put together a college plan, not because what they knew uh, on how to fill out a FAFSA. They just said, you're going to go to college. We're going to do everything we need to to make sure you go to college. So we went to college. And I vividly remember Parents Weekend at the beginning of my freshman semester at the University of Arizona. As my twin brother and I walked my parents through the campus, my father surprised us uh, because as we were walking and we were really worried that we wanted to make our parents feel comfortable in this foreign environment. And as we were walking, my, my father <clears throat> started calling out buildings. Uh, that's the administration building and that's Harville building and that's social sciences building. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm dumbfounded and I look to my brother and <clears throat> he looks to me and I said, Ruben, what's, what's, what's going on with dad? You know, dad seems to know a lot more than we think he knows. So I said to my dad, I said, dad, how do, how do you know the campus? And he said, mijo, which is a diminutive uh, endeared term for a son, mijo. Um, you see, I built that building. Uh, I worked on the crew that installed the ductwork and flashing on that building. 
uh, we were part of the crew that did this, this, and this on that building. Uh, and then he looked at me with a look that I rarely saw in my dad's eyes. He was a strong man, and he looked at me with a look he rarely, I rarely saw in his eyes, and he said to me, with tears in his eyes, he said, but never did I ever think that I would be back on this campus and not wearing my tool belt. But instead, I'd be back here as the father of two university students. You see, my friends, that dream, that aspiration that my father had for my brother and I is exactly the aspiration I know, I have heard, I have felt as I've traveled throughout the five boroughs in New York City that parents have for their children. And in the way my brother and I beat the odds and we exceeded expectations perhaps that were for us, it existed because our parents and grandparents all believed that there was a better future for us. It's well past time to change those odds for all of our students in New York City, to break down those outdated expectations, to shatter the implicit bias that exists in some of our communities about who should, who can, and who will be successful in our school system. It's time to build a future that's not bound by history, that's not bound by demogra uh, demography. This is what equity and excellence is all about. And we believe that we can create a school system in New York City that reflects the best of us, that we can unleash our students' innate brilliance and unlock their creativity and put them on a path to their future. We can do it, but we cannot do it with every, without everyone in this room. So to teachers, college administrators, and educators, our valued partners, I encourage you to continue your focus on the challenges teachers will face in the classroom. Discuss the effects of racism and segregation on student learning. Give us more research that we can hang our hat on. Discuss what, discuss what it means to educate the whole child. Discuss the realities of teaching high-need students in urban public schools. Talk about equity. Act upon equity. Please make it your mantra as we make it our mantra. To the aspiring teachers that may be here or listening here today, I encourage you to be open to the array of different experiences your students will bring into your classroom every day. Meet your students where they are. Advance equity in your classroom by holding high expectations for all of your students. And if you think that all children can't learn at high levels, I'd like to ask you to do something very, very honestly and sincere. If you do not believe every student can succeed, if you do not believe every student should have the opportunity to a pathway to a college and a high paying career, if that's not what you believe about our students, I'm going to very respectfully, with much love, invite you to find another profession. So my friends, let's have high expectations for all of our students. Let's refuse to accept the system that allows some of our children to succeed while others don't. We must disrupt the status quo. We must advance equity. And we must do that now. Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with me? Then together we will. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share these thoughts. Thank you, Chancellor Carranza, for inspiring us, motivating us, and challenging us to advance equity and excellence now. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists to keep things moving, and then we're going to invite you into our living room, if you will, uh, for the next part of our program. Amy Stewart Wells is, is Professor of Sociology and Education, current president of American Education uh, Educational Research Association, ARA and director of TC's Reimagined Education Institute, which equips teachers with new strategies to engage an increasingly diverse student population. Michael Rebell is professor of law and educational practice at Teachers College and Columbia Law School and executive director of Teachers College Center for Educational Equity, one of the foremost authorities on the education adequacy movement in the United States. He served as a lead attorney in the lawsuit that in 2006 brought New York City billions of additional dollars in school funding from New York State. Please join me in welcoming our two panelists. Before I take my seat, I'm going to mention the uh, first question that we've taken from the audience for uh, Chancellor Carranza, and then we'll have some questions from our panelists. The first question is, will 3K 
pre-K classrooms cultivate play and wonder? Will 3K pre-K classroom, co classrooms cultivate play and wonder? A great question. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me through this? Here we go. Testing, testing, testing. So that is a great question, and I am going to absolutely answer that question. But, uh, sir, with your permission, I'd like to take a point of personal privilege uh, and recognize one of my educational heroes that's in this audience, sure. who is a faculty member here at Teachers College, who I call my brother from another mother, because we have worked together when I was in Houston. We've worked together when I was in San Francisco. Uh, his book has been required reading. Uh, for many of the faculties that I've led as a principal, region superintendent, deputy superintendent, and I'm just thrilled that he's here and I'm in his home, uh, his home uh, living room, and I just want to recognize Dr. Chris Emden, who is here from Teachers College. Thank you. Thank you. So will we cultivate play? Absolutely. Absolutely. Play is the fundamental cornerstone of what, what it means to educate children. And especially as it pertains to the 3K world, uh, we want students to explore. We want them to be developmentally appropriately stimulated. We want them to be able to create. But at the same time, make no mistake, there should be a purposeful, uh, I would say, arrangement of learning opportunities so that students are actually developing skill sets uh, as well as being able to play. Now, at some point in the future, I'll talk, or maybe even today, I'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. But we, we have allowed ourselves politically to be in a space where test scores become the sum total of a student and the sum total of a school. I vehemently push back against that. Now, there are some people who are going to say, well, just don't do any test scores. Well, it's not that simple. Federal government has billions of dollars that they use to fund our school systems. We have to have some semblance of, of a test score. The state of New York requires us to administer summative tests as well. That being said, it doesn't mean it should drive your curriculum. Kids should, whether it's 3K or in the 12th grade, have an opportunity during their school day to experience the arts. They should be able to sing. They should be able to dance. They should be able to play. They should be able to create. And when we're talking about the arts, it shouldn't be just a Eurocentric notion of what the arts are. They should be able to rap. They should be able to break it down and show the alliteration between the liter literature that they read and the poetic license that you take when you make sense of your world. You see, that's the full child. And that is especially important as we think about our 3K students. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Amy or Michael? Well, um, I'd like to um, take advantage of a phrase you used in your remarks, Chancellor. You said you wish for once somebody would throw some money at you and you'd know what to do with it. Well, as you know, even though we won the CFE litigation <laughs> years ago and the state committed to billions of dollars to fund New York City schools, uh, at the present moment, Andrew Cuomo and the state legislature are behind about a billion and a half dollars in what they owe New York City under the foundation aid formula. So my question is, if we get that billion and a half dollars, what are going to be the priorities? You talked about uh, the need for kids in all our schools to get the education they're entitled to. Under state law right now, every kid who's not reaching proficient scores is entitled to academic intervention services. Tens of thousands of kids in this city are not getting them. We also know under the Commissioner regulations, for example, all schools are supposed to have library media specialists, which are of critical importance in uh, learning the Internet, social media, how to use them properly. I could go on and on, and you know the, the needs better than I do. So I guess I'm asking priorities. If you get that billion and a half dollars, how are you going to show that they're not just throwing money? How are you going to make good use of it to really promote equity? Yes, so I want to thank you, Professor, for your, your landmark legislation. And I just want to, again, uh, state publicly what I said to you privately when we met. Uh, the minute that lawsuit goes to a court of law, I'm going to be on the witness stand testifying with you and being able to point out where some of these inequities uh, manifest themselves in our schools and our communities. Uh, look, we know what we need. Uh, it's not rocket science, uh, but it's really important to understand that from an equity perspective, not all students walk that threshold into our schools uh, equally um, positioned to be successful in school. We have communities that suffer from intergenerational poverty. We have schools and communities that suffer from all of the ills of a large urban uh, city. 
We have unemployment. We have non-nuclear families. We have job insecurity. We have residential insecurity, i.e. homeless students, foster care. We have students that have had a myriad of traumatic events. Uh, and the mere fact that they're in school is an incredible accomplishment to get them there. Now, once we get them to school, and for some of our students, that is the only safe space they have their entire day. And we know that to address the needs of our students, we should probably have lower class sizes. We know to address the needs of students, we should probably have social workers. We know to address the needs of the students, we should have counselors that can actually not only work on the trauma in terms of counseling, but how about career college uh, preparation for students, not in the high school, that's too late, in the elementary school, starting students in elementary with preparing their college going uh, plans. We know that there are, uh, there's a need for rich extracurricular activities. We know that in New York City, and by the way, I have, uh, I have my colleagues working on a five-year uh, master plan for this, every student at least in the elementary school should have an experience with fine arts every single day, yet it doesn't happen. We know that when I walk some communities in the Bronx, communities in central Brooklyn, in Williamsburg, uh, some communities uh, across this uh, across the city. Students don't have air conditioning. Students don't have technology. Students don't have modern libraries equipped with the kind of research uh, equipment that would allow them to do real world exploration and research. We know that there are students that are in our community that every day have an enriching experience by going to museums and going to different libraries and different points of interest in the greatest city in the world, New York City, yet we know there are other students who have never left a three block radius of their current home environment. So the question is a legitimate and a very good question. What would you do with the money? I say to you 1.5 billion isn't enough. But you give us 1.5 billion, we're gonna attack every one of the things you just mentioned in terms of the communities that have historically been underserved, and we're gonna show that we can actually have accountability and return on investment. Here's for our business folks out there, ROI on your investment, because the ROI will have immediate repercussions in terms of improving the academic and I would say social emotional uh, performance of our students, but the long-term economic impact is going to be to the greater New York City as a whole. Because you see, my friends, as we sit here, no matter what we invest in, L in our students right now, if we do not invest and do not look at the investment as an investment, we cannot look at it as an expense on a line item that we can either lower or increase. But if we look at it as an investment and make that investment, it's a very economical investment on the part of the state of New York, one and a half billion dollars. Because if we don't, the payment that we will have to make later in terms of incarceration, loss of tax dollars, loss of productivity, loss of GDP, is going to be much more than $1.5 billion. So we either invest now or we will most assuredly pay much more later. Welcome, Chancellor, and, and thank you for your uh, lecture and your you comments on today. Powerful, yes, thank you. And um, as we've mentioned, we do run a summer workshop on Wednesday. Faculty from six different departments working on the education of the And thinking about culturally relevant pedagogy, working on racial literacy and culturally sustaining leadership. And it's a powerful PD experience for teachers. We now have educators coming from all over the country and from other countries, including Finland, to learn about how we do this. So one of the things that we learned this summer from Angela Valenzuela from University of Texas at Austin was the power of the ethnic studies work in the Southwest that I know you've been a part of, and the role of universities in playing a, a central role in that work and influencing policy at the district level. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about where this powerful work around culturally relevant pedagogy in the Northeast connects with the work of the ethnic studies movement in the Southwest and what we could learn in New York um, about that and what role the universities could play. Sure, so our university partners are critical partners. Um, I would say to you that uh, right here at Teachers College, I, I mentioned Dr. Enden and his work uh, around his uh, pedagogy, uh, of hip hop pedagogy and the real pedagogy incredibly engaging. Why? Because that's how students learn, that's how they demonstrate who they are, that's how they demonstrate their brilliance. 
Uh, when I served uh, as superintendent of schools in the San Francisco Unified School District, I was very fortunate to work with my colleagues to establish uh, one of the first ethnic studies curricula in the United States that was adopted by the board as a graduation requirement. Not as an elective, not as an after school club, it was, a, it was a required part of the graduation plan. And the reason that that was so important is that when we were studying and we had students that as we were piloting this program and this curricula, it was the University, uh, the San Francisco State University that worked hand in hand providing the pedagogical uh, organizational structures <coughs> to our classroom teachers as they built this curricula based on the student needs in our school system. And as they piloted it, they were able to give us critical information and actually amplify and give us ways of checking what the authenticity was of that curricula. So that by the time that we brought the recommendation to the board uh, for their adoption, it was solid. It was teacher driven, but it was also university, uh, I would say the good housekeeping seal of approval. Yes, this is rigorous. Yes, this is aligned. Yes, there is a mechanism for identifying the efficacy of the implementation. Uh, I will tell you that there was a report just done at Stanford University that showed a comparison group of students that participated in the ethnic studies curricula versus students that did not. One of those rare opportunities in education where we actually have two of those sample groups. And, and I will tell you that the students that participated in ethnic studies curricula far outperformed students that did not in terms of not only um, their, their attendance, but their credit attainment. Their, in California, they have something called your A through, A through G, which is the, the courses you need to take to go to the top tier state universities. The A through G attainment was significantly more than other students that didn't. And their graduation rate was significantly more. Don't stop there. In my hometown, Tucson, Arizona, where they had a Mexican-American studies curricula, again, uh, the, the data is clear that when you connect this kind of curricula to students, uh, that students will do well, and they will do significantly well. The one caveat that I would have for us as we think about that here in New York City is that if you see one ethnic studies or one specific type of curricula, you've seen one. It needs to be community-based, it needs to be integrated to the community and make sure that it's meeting and attending to the, the idiosyncrasies of the community. But I think what overgirds everything or undergirds everything is this notion that it's rigorous, it's a rigorous way of social science uh, imparted to students to be able to study these problems of society. Uh, and I think more than anything, it really, really, um, amplify students' ability to, to perform higher order thinking skills. By the way, we're working on that now. Preview of coming attractions, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask a question uh, just, just in terms of what we're trying to do in leadership and, and some of the research that we do uh, in education leadership looks at leaders looking at their racial awareness and how it impacts practice. And obviously, you, you've come to this work with uh, a culturally responsive approach and uh, some, you know, certainly some authority on that in, in, in doing the work. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the plan and, and, and training your leaders and, and teachers to do this work, especially when they may be in some prep programs where they may, they've had no exposure to uh, working in urban environments or they're, they're you know, just uncomfortable working with poor kids of color? You know, what, what would be some... some uh, first of all, telling us how your program is set up to address that, and then mm -hmm. I think you said training 150,000? 150,000. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So um, the, the pipeline issue around not only leadership but education uh, and teachers is critically important. So we cannot do what we want to do or pretend to do without a partnership with our partners in higher institutions of higher learning. So it's, incredib it's incredibly important that those conversations about what should teachers have in their tool belt when they graduate and are about to go out into the, into the real world of, of, of a classroom, that's an incredibly important conversation that we're having with lots of our partners here in the city. That being said, the, the, the conversation around leadership in an urban environment is you just can't have any leader go into a school and pretend to know what they're going to do in that school. You have to take the time to understand not only the history, the context, and the roadmap that has happened in our schools. And the reason I say that is that there is real trauma 
in some of our school communities here in New York City and elsewhere that I've lived, to be very honest and very fair. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you look at any large or even semi-large, but if you look at any urban environment over the last 15 to 20 years, I'm going to tell you some uh, undeniable truths. The number of schools that have gotten closed or subsequently had in intensive scrutiny are schools that are historically in black or Latino neighborhoods. So when you come into a school and you say, I'm going to be about really increasing the academic achievement of this school, what that translates to in many communities is, okay, here we go again. When are they going to close us? Here we go again. When are they going to truncate us? Here we go again. When are they going to rip this community and take the school? So leadership has to be embedded in the context of what you're trying to lead. That being said, you cannot just think about ABC. It can't be about reading, writing, arithmetic, and that's what I'm really going to focus on. It's important. Don't mistake what I'm saying. It's important for you to have a strong instructional uh, approach. It's important that you have continuous improvement. It's important that you have a way to, to document and track how students are doing so you don't wait like Reeves has talked about. You don't wait for the autopsy at the end of the year, but you have formative you know, physical exams, so it's formative assessments throughout the year. But what are you assessing throughout the year? That's where the cultural relevance has to be important about what are kids learning? How are they learning? How are adults interacting with the students? Uh, what's also important is that as adults are interacting with students, you have to pay attention to the social emotional learning needs in a school. Uh, I like to tell folks, you can't do the Bloom thing unless you're doing um, the Maslow thing. And think about that. Kids cannot be, cannot be academically challenged unless they feel safe, they feel supported, they feel that they have a place in their school environment. That's traditionally teacher's college accepted, exempted. That's traditionally not what we learn in leadership preparation programs. So being able to attend to those types of issues that make all the difference in communities of color, but more importantly, communities that have historically underserved populations is incredibly important. And that's the kind of pipeline that we're building within the Department of Education right now to build our future leaders. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe have time for one more. Okay, I've got, I'd like to pick up on a phrase you mentioned in, I think, the first sentence of your talk today, which is, we want to prepare our students to be citizens for tomorrow. But in the bulk of your comments, you talked about getting the kids college and career ready, which is important. Uh, last summer in their ESSA plan, the New York Regents expanded the outcome goals of education in New York State to be college, career, and citizenship ready. Uh, so we're putting a big emphasis on, on citizenship preparation now at TC. Uh, we know it's important. Our democratic institutions are being challenged, and our kids are the only hope, quite frankly, uh, of rectifying this in the future. I know the mayor's got a civic education initiative. I'm not sure what it is, <laughs> to be honest with you, and I wish you could enlighten us on what uh, the system's going to be doing to build citizens for tomorrow that can really be effective in maintaining our democracy. I think you just described the goals of that citizenship initiative. We want students and young people to be aware of what their voice is in terms of policy. We want them to be aware that they have, if they are eligible to be registered to vote, that we help to register them to vote. Uh, this, uh, this year, uh, we registered almost 40,000 students to register uh, to vote. Uh, we don't tell them who to vote for or what to vote for, but we just want them to be registered to vote. Um, I will give you some other examples of what that also means in real, in real terms. So as we're developing our integration policies, our anti-segregation policies, as we're looking about building our ethnic studies programs, uh, I have a student advisory panel, which again is a very small, minute fraction of the 1.1 million students in our school system. But they sit at the table, a very big table, with me and my senior staff working through the details of what should that look like. Uh, they advise me on policies that have to do with uh, not everything from uh, what kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, apparel are okay in schools, dress codes, uh, to advising me right now in how we're renegotiating our memorandum of understanding with the New York City Police Department around the role of law enforcement in our schools. And I will tell you that 
some of the most powerful voices around integration uh, have been from our students who experience the inequity and the injustices uh, on a daily basis and can articulately talk about those in, in real time. Um, so we're giving students a place at the table, we're listening and we're incorporating their voices, but at the same time, we're doing all of the mechanical things to make sure they understand not only what is our system, how do you impact our system, and then how do we get you involved in terms of being able to have a voice and vote for our system. The only reason that I don't use the term citizenship as much as I probably should is that we have a number of our students and communities in our city that are feeling trauma and have been traumatized. Uh, you know, I talk about, you know, 64, 10, and 24, and, or 23, and people say 64, 10, 24. Well, what are you talking about? 64 years ago, Brown versus Board of Education, where are we? 10, 10 years ago, I remember where I was on a November night 24 years ago. I was in my, bed, in my living room celebrating. We had elected the first black president in the history of this country, and I felt euphoric, and I said, we are in a post-racial society. We have reached the mountaintop, as the good Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, we're done. That 10 years ago has given us the 23 years we are living in now. And the beef that I've got, I don't care what people's political affiliations are, the beef that I've got is that there are students and families in my community, our community, that do not feel comfortable going from their home to their school for an event because of what might happen to them or what might be the result of them getting picked up or going from the school home. That is causing trauma in our neighborhoods. And on one hand, when we say we want you to be civically involved and we want you to be part of the fabric of our community and be a, a contributor, yet we give the mixed message coming from the executive office in this country that says, but you're not welcomed here. You're really not, you're not a real American because you're a, you're a Muslim. Or you're, not a, you're just a rapist because you're you know, from Latin America. It gives our children real mixed messages. And part of that coded message, quite frankly, and unfortunately, is when we say you have to be a citizen. Because citizen for them has been painted now as something that they will never be able to attain in the current administration. So we're very careful about the words that we use and very intentional about saying, you don't have to be a citizen to be a productive member of our society. In fact, we welcome you. We want you to be here. And I don't know if you read the article, but we have a New York City graduate who is now the first DACA student to be a Rhodes Scholar out of Harvard. Came right here from New York City. So if anybody can prove it, it's right here in New York City. Awesome. I want to uh, move us to close. I want to uh, thank my TC colleagues and fellow panelists. Please give them a hand. <laughs> also want to thank Chancellor Carranza for this fantastic message and lecture. Please give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you.